Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts, of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is May 1st, 2012, and my guest is David Owen, journalist and author. His latest book is The Conundrum, which we discussed a few episodes back on Econ Talk. Today we're going to discuss an earlier book of his, The First National Bank of Dad, A Foolproof Method for Teaching Your Kids the Value of Money. David, welcome back to Econ Talk. Thank you. Now, people tend to think of economics as being about money. It's something that frustrates me as an economist that people often on an airplane, if I tell them I'm an economist, will ask me advice about the stock market or tell me that must be handy during tax time. And of course, I don't know a lot about the stock market and I pay someone to do my taxes. Uh, But people do – there is a part of economics that is about money, obviously. Transactions and investing and saving are all – have to do with money, and those are economics. But what I also like about money uh, and about your book is that it reminds me of what a student told me that she had heard from a former professor, that economics is the study of how to get the most out of life. And this book, while about money, is really about helping our children get the most out of life. And of course, that would help us too as parents. The National Bank of Dad, which your book is Uh, the title of your book comes from, is your way to encourage your children to postpone pleasure and to learn about savings, which is a very valuable skill. So how does the National Bank of Dad work? Well, what what happened, the story was that when my daughter was very little, I did the thing that parents always do. And when she was about three, I took her down to the bank and made a big show of opening a savings account for her with a check for $100 and then explained how the banking system worked and uh, essentially explaining that, you know, if you leave this hundred dollars there for, for a year, but basically until you're in kindergarten, it'll, it will yield enough interest for you to buy a pack of gum. Uh, <laughs> and <laughs> she wasn't, she wasn't blew, very interested. Blew her away. Yeah. And uh, she was even less interested when she discovered that although this hundred dollars was technically hers, I wasn't going to let her put her hands on it. And I attributed her lack of interest to, you know, to youthful, to immaturity and irresponsibility and all the things that, uh, uh, that, that parents usually accuse their children of. And it, it was only later, unfortunately, it was several years later that I realized that, that her, uh, or her disappointment was the result not of her ignorance about money, but of her uh, acute understanding of it and <laughs> that, that, uh, I was that she was getting a raw deal and it didn't make any sense. And so it was uh and that was, was because the save, the interest rate was so remarkably low. So remarkably low. Low even for a grown up, but if you're if you're 3 years old and uh you know a year is a thousand years away and most of the things we tell our kids, we, you know, you have to save money uh so that you can go to college when you're older, so that you, you know go so that you can leave your mother and father and live uh Live in a faraway place with people you don't know, and go to, and study very hard things, much harder than kindergarten. It 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 none of these things. It's a real turn on the children, like like an incentive. And uh, I think that the the sort of the, the underlying lesson of economics is that people do things that they're rewarded for doing, and then if we want to use uh, economics to encourage people to to do things, we have to reward them. There, there have to be rewards that seem like rewards to them, and that that was what I I think that was the insight that I ultimately had after a number of years of thinking about it was that the reason my kids weren't interested in the banking system as I presented it to them was that there was nothing in it for them. Uh, and where that led me was to th- to think that how would how would I do this uh, in a way that how could I give them incentives that would seem like incentives to them. And what I ultimately decided was that their, their money had to grow at a rate that where they would notice it growing. Uh, it had to, things had to happen on on a time scale that that, hmm. that uh, seemed reasonable to them. And and what I ultimately did was create a bank account in my house, a savings bank, 
in my house uh, in which I paid them an interest rate of 5% a month on their uh, on their deposits. Uh, that works out an annual percentage rate of something like 70%. And uh, I sat them down. They were they were six and ten, and uh, roughly explained this idea. You know, my son was six. Uh, he wasn't even doing arithmetic really yet, and yet he immediately grasped the idea of interest and compound interest. And uh, he, he went and gathered up all his change and put it on my desk and said, you know, that he wanted me to credit it to him today because <laughs> uh, <laughs> what I had explained to get him it, get was, it working get it working he <laughs> wanted his money in there what he called charging up he said he liked to leave his money charging up in his account for a while before yeah. he spent any of it um, and uh, I, the, the basic idea was that if we give children incentives that seem like incentives to them they'll 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 do what human nature tells them to do and I think uh, the the general lesson that is that it's usually easier to harness human nature than it is to try to change it. And most of what uh, parents do when they try to teach their kids about money have to do with uh, with changing, thwarting human nature, with uh, uh, with sort of bending our children to our, our will rather than actually doing what we claim we're doing, which is to teach them about how money works. And how did the uh, bank of dad work out? It worked very. It worked extremely well. Uh, they they both caught on. What I did was I, I set up a sort of a dummy account in Quicken, and I would put their allowances in each month, and then at the end of, at the end of the month I would I would apply my five percent interest rate, and and their their balances would increase. And if, as long the next, as as long as they didn't withdraw. Money. As long as they well, it would the, whatever the balance was, uh, the 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 five percent would apply to whatever it was at the end of the month. And they understood that if they if they left that money or some of that money in, that the the five percent the next month would apply to that as well. This was this was my son's intuitive understanding of of compound interest, which he then illustrated with it. He had this he he decided that what he would do and uh, he drew a picture that uh, in which he said that he was going to invent a a potion, a grape flavored potion that would make him live for uh, a very very long time and would deposit his money and and then after the end of this very long period of time, he would have a trillion dollars or something like that. And there was, he had a picture, a line of trucks hauling off his fortune <laughs> that, that, <laughs> that had built up over that time. And uh, they understood it, and uh, immediately they both became savers. Uh, I think what, you know, what we usually do with kids, I know my kids felt this way, that if a kid, if you, if a kid gets $5 in a Christmas stocking, say, uh, they view that as... That's real money. If they get a check for $100, they know that their parents are going to grab it and stick it in some account someplace that they won't have any access to. So uh, $5 is real money, $100 is not. And if you receive cash, you either have to hide it from your parents or <laughs> do what my kids used to do, which was to say, you know, I want to be taken to the mall right now. I want to convert yeah. this. <laughs> this um, get it into hard currency. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I want to convert it into something that you can't confiscate. Yeah. Uh, and that once they... Uh, once the you know the bank of dad was in place, their feelings changed about it. The other element of it, in addition to the high percentage rate, was that they had to have control over over their money. So when they came to me and said, "I'd want to take twenty dollars out of my uh, out of my account in in your bank," um, there was no questions asked. I would I would give it to them. That didn't mean that the the rules of the family. Uh, had been suspended, they couldn't go out and you know spend it on on uh, you know firearms or drugs, and, and they couldn't uh, they couldn't just because they could afford it, they couldn't eat candy when whenever they wanted to. All the family rules still applied, but if they wanted to make uh, if they wanted to spend their money on something foolish as, as they sometimes did, uh, that was their decision, and I think that was an important part of it too because. Uh, I think we learn about money the way we learn about anything, which is by uh, making a series of gradually less ca catastrophic mistakes, and uh, you know, eventually by trial and error, seeing what works and what doesn't. Uh, in in families where kids really don't have their own money, uh, where they have to beg for every dollar they spend or ask for it, and they have no incentive to uh, to think about the consequences of 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 buying something dumb because uh, they're not in, they have no control over it. Where it's just money magically appears and disappears. You know, when they have it, they should get rid of it. 
because uh, the only way to get more is to uh, is to be out of it. Uh, and so I think once my children had their it's like own running life, a like running a government agency. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> don't, leave anything, any, like, don't leave any for or, next year. Or, or yes, or being a <laughs> being the CEO of a public uh, corporation of a, a public corporation where you have access to this. Where if you just skim a tiny bit off the uh, shareholders' equity, no one will notice. But you can fly around to, to your golf game in a corporate jet. I think there are all these these. We tend to be very careful when we spend our own money. We're much less careful when we're spending other people's money. And that applies to kids too. I mean, my kids, when they were young, they were, uh, they couldn't have been more reckless when they were spending my money. But when they were spending theirs, uh, they were very thoughtful. And there was a, when we went on vacation, I used to tell the kids, uh, you know, I'm going to give you, here's some souvenir money. Here's some money for the extra money for the vacation. Here's $20. Uh, uh, but I would give it to them before we left. And I would, I would just add it to their, to their bank accounts. And I would say, you know, here's 20 bucks. It's your extra vacation money. You can spend it on anything you like, the souvenirs, or you can spend it now. Uh, you can save it till later. You can do whatever you want. But while we're on vacation, I don't want you to ask me for money for, you know, for junky T-shirts or anything like that. No, you, here's, here it is right now. And they then, because it was theirs, they were far less likely than um, the average kid to uh, want to do something dumb with it. And there was a uh, there was a situation where we went with some friends to a little souvenir store, and uh, one of the other children, who was a close friend of my my son, uh, made a big scene. He wanted a there was a rubber tomahawk that was some $5. hideous thing that they just have thing. to have until it's they have to pay for it. Then they yeah. <laughs> right exactly, and he got it. I mean, he made a, enough of a scene that finally his father decided that the the simplest thing would, would be to cave, and then as soon as he had the you know the the thrill of of the hunt was over, and the child lost interest in the in the tomahawk, which then immediately broke. Uh, but my son knew that it was futile to get into that sort of conversation with me because he had his own money, and he sort of he he slowly and carefully studied the very unpromising merchandise in this <laughs> store, and and eventually decided that that he wanted to buy an unopened uh, geode for thirty three cents. Uh, and, stone, uh, so that you could crack it open. Yeah, yeah. a hollow stone with with jewel like crystals inside of it. Uh, the, the the geodes were actually selling three for a dollar, but he negotiated with the woman who ran the store and said that he he want, asked her to break up uh, a set and sell him <laughs> just one of them for thirty three cents because he didn't he thought the two the two extras were superfluous and and I didn't have any didn't take any part in that negotiation, but he succeeded and he she sold him one geode for thirty three cents and that was. That was what he spent, and uh, I'm sure that if he, you know, if if I'd been willing to buy him a tomahawk, he would have been happy to have one of those too. But because it was his money, uh, he was he was much more responsible. And the, I think the the interesting thing about that is that we we didn't have to have any discussion about this. Uh, the we didn't have to talk about the you know the value of I don't know or the 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 lack of value of of, of cheesy merchandise or uh, the the importance of of judging your purchases it's obvious I think kids understand it intuitively from a very young age uh, they understand how money works that's why they don't like the systems that we put in place for them and left on his own he did he did very well even though he was extremely young the part I like about it especially is the is the lack of debating uh, one of the things that distresses me. Sometimes when I watch other people as they're negotiating with their children uh, and they start off saying no and then they end up saying yes. It would be better to yeah. say yes right away, it seems to me, or no the whole time. But the no yes encourages the future <laughs> debating session. Maybe the parents like it. I always dislike it. I think most parents really actually do. I, we did a uh, – our very first podcast uh, episode of Econ Talk was with uh, my friend Don Cox at Boston College on the economics of parenting and um, – it may amuse some of you who haven't heard it to go back and hear number one, Don, who's a, a great uh, insightful parent, but also my uh, interviewing style, which has changed over the over the years. But he had a similar insight about letting children do what they want when it wasn't very harmful and they learned lessons and you didn't have to uh, negotiate constantly. So I think that's one of the great uh, advantages of this approach. Yeah, and you, you still have to be careful up there. I, I think there there are – if you know that that uh, disaster lies ahead, you know if a five-year-old wants to buy something that is really 
beyond her ability to to care for. Enjoy. There are times when yeah. you have to step in, but I think that you you know we we it's better if we resist our urge to to uh, to spare our children these these educational uh, um, experiences. And I, I I know my son at one point bought uh, he was interested in uh, trading cards and he bought a big box of of uh, basketball cards for I uh, it's like fifty dollars or something like that. It was it was it, it was it was crazy and but he didn't realize it was crazy until after he'd done it and 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 sort of weighed the the satisfaction he had he had received from opening these umpteen packages of of basketball cards with with which was very very short lived little thrill with uh what he could have done with the fifty dollars if he still had it and yep. uh um but I don't think that's something that you you can't teach that lesson in the abstract you it's something you have to do yourself and then it it sticks with you for for a long time. So I think, you know, I, I remember when my kids got their driver's licenses, uh, I, I, I hoped the way parents always do, you want your child to have a, a, a frightening but not uh, dangerous accident of some kind. Yeah. Uh, because they, they don't pay attention until they, they've had some kind of a fender bender. You don't want anybody to get hurt, uh, but you need to, it was certainly true in the case of both my kids, that they didn't really understand the uh the complexity of driving until they had screwed up and uh yeah i try so I think, to i try to convey that by the screaming and the clutching <laughs> the clutching of the dashboard and the right. the writhing to suggest that they're in the wrong lane yeah. uh it's a subtle signal uh <laughs> the body language i think is particularly effective when you know you're corkscrewing around the seat to suggest that maybe you shouldn't be driving on the curb uh, <laughs> yeah right as Maybe you're we yelling, check the mirror before yeah. we before we change lanes. Now I'm going to give a counterpoint to your to your um, position, and I want to say before I do, this is a lovely book. It's beautifully written, it's amusing, and it's full of insight about parenting and money. Uh, and I enjoyed it immensely. I had the privilege or lack of privilege of reading it after uh, two of. I have four kids. They're all now twelve and older. Uh, they're twelve, fourteen, seventeen, and nineteen. So many of them have – their attitudes toward money and, and these issues have already been set in place in some dimension at least, although I think when you go out and work for the first time and earn a real paycheck and pay taxes, other educational lessons do kick in. But I, I run – my wife and I treat money and our children very differently than you did. What, what I'm going to say now – so I'm going to – even though we do it differently, I think what you did was glorious. I would have been – Happy to have done it with my children. I'm not sure my wife would have gone along with it, but uh, in a way, the fact that we did something radically different and got similar results or results we're happy with could be confirmation bias. I'm just fooling myself, but I think the more important point is you have to have a consistent attitude at a minimum toward the way you treat money with your children. This issue we talked about of negotiating is really this the single worst thing you can do. So in our house, our kids had very little control over their money. Uh, we did squirrel our way, as you said. We lectured them a lot about how money worked, or I did, being the econ teacher, and gave them a lot of – told them a lot of things that probably didn't sink in uh, because they weren't experienced. They were just told to them about diversification and other issues we might talk about in a few minutes. But what I found interesting is that when we proposed that we go to see uh, Wicked as a family – uh, my kids said, "Well, how much do the tickets cost?" And and I said, "Well, they're they're it's expensive." But I'm thinking to myself, "But well, they're not paying for it, right?" So in a way, where they might some of my children have a lot of interest in in just the level of things. I thought they were just curious. You know, they want to find out about the world. I said, "Well, they're they're about ninety dollars a piece." Well, let's not go. And I said, "Well, you're going to really like it. It's a great musical, and I think it's worth it." Oh, but if we go, then the next thing you're going to say, no, we just went to Wicked. So they <laughs> they did. They understood it was our money, right, and that they would pay some price. In fact, sometimes when we give our kids money to go buy stuff, uh, they go out to a baseball game, say, with their friends, they'll come home and return our money and say it just wasn't, you know, it just wasn't worth it. The soda was too expensive or whatever it was. Uh, so they have, for maybe I'm lucky. Uh, but we've had a consistent attitude toward money, and our kids are not spendthrifts, and they like to they like to squirrel their money away too. It makes me wonder whether maybe it's all genetic. Uh, uh, it may very well be, and I think you're, I think you're right that consistency is critical, and also that that uh, 
Uh, I, I'm sure there's a you know there's a genetic a genetic component, a luck component, uh, just a um, and there's also I think that if you if you love your children, you can screw up in all kinds of ways, or you can do things differently in lots of ways and end up with the same result. Uh, the, and, I, and I know that if you if you are if you have a dysfunctional household, no matter what system you employ yeah, to for sure. teach your children anything, it's not going to work because there the pro, there there are issues that are that are deep below. And I, I think your method of uh, the high, artificially high rate of interest to teach the value of saving really teaches the deeper lesson I mentioned at the start, which is uh, the delaying of pleasure or gratification, which um, the urge to take your money, which adults have as well, and buy something shiny and pretty and satisfying for a brief period of time that may not last as a, as a true source of satisfaction. Um, so yeah, I think it seems I think to be we, very important. I think when we tell kids about saving, we tend to we tend to to stress the deprivation side of it, <laughs> uh, and not and not really explain that there's something on the other end too. That with, I think that the the value to the kids of having this artificially high uh, rate of return was that they could see in what seemed to them like real time that if they delayed that gratification, they could actually uh, increase their their satisfaction, and and and, and I think that's the way you and I think about it. We think. We're not saving for retirement just because, uh, assuming that we are, uh, just because uh, we want to make things hard on ourselves now. We're yeah. doing it because we think that if we do, we'll, in the long run, we will have more, take more net pleasure from our lives than we would if we didn't. Yeah, it's not only about building character. Yeah, that, right, right, that exactly. elusive value, which is not so obvious, certainly when you're 11 or 14. This is good for you. I don't like it. It's good for you. I don't <laughs> yeah. like it. So if you say it's good for you because you're going to like it even more later, you have a shot at least. Yeah, and there was a, there's a downside to success too, which is that as my kids got old, older, and especially and and beca- became successful savers, and as especially as my daughter got to be babysitting age, that five yeah. percent a month became unrealistic, and I and so I had to explain to them that the the law of supply and demand applied to the supply of money as well, and 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 announced that I was reducing my monthly interest rate to three percent, and they squawked at first, but then you know they under they understood the need for it and they were fine with that. But and by that time they didn't have a they, better alternative either. <laughs> no, they didn't. They did not. And uh, and and by that time they they had they'd seen how it worked and they'd accumulated significant balances. Uh, I think it should also be said that there that all the I think it's easiest uh to teach kids about money when there's uh you know obviously when there's money in in the family but not when there's too much and and not when there's too little. I think money is the hardest uh for a place where money is very tight and and in situations where money is essentially boundless. Uh, I think it's hardest hardest for uh, the poor and the rich to teach their yeah, kids about money. I think that's first, because poverty is not much of a teacher. There's, there's not much to learn. You have no. It's all necessity. And at the rich end, it's um, you. It's hard to create the kinds of artificial scarcity that you need to make to make decisions seem as though they mean anything. And and it's sort of it's it's uh, uh it's easier in the middle and um, where most of us are. Which where is most good. of us are. Yeah. I think it, <laughs> even if we dream about winning the lottery. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about the stock market. Uh, you did an interesting. Uh, one of my, I think my, f- there are many pages of the book that I found more uh, inspiring and moving than the one I'm going to mention. But my favorite intellectual page of the book was the critique of the way that modern uh, schools teach about uh, teach their students about the stock market. So uh, tell tell us what's wrong with that, which I confess to agree with about 173 percent. And then talk about what you did instead. Well, remind me if I forget anything. But um, at the this, at the time I wrote the book, the, the stock market stock market was all that anybody talked about because the stock market was was raging. And everybody was getting rich. Uh, and what schools tended to do was you, you'd have a uh, a pretend stock market where kids would would uh, you know make imaginary investments, and then you would gauge it a month later and see who went or at the end of the marking period and see who ended up ahead. Who had ended up ahead? It's a contest. A contest, exactly, and that kind of uh, contest is teaches whatever everything wrong about investing. Uh, it is it is not Warren the way Warren Buffett does it, and encourages a sort of um, all or nothing gamble where you can you want uh, extreme volatility. You you're only worried about a month from now. Uh, you, you 
it encourages you to roll the dice, which if you have a, I guess if you have a, um, the right set of nerves for it, uh, there are people who make, a, who make their living doing that. But it's not a, really a very good uh, lesson to teach children uh, who, uh, about life skills of investing in the stock market. And I'd say it's the, it's the worst lesson. You the worst possible <laughs> lesson. I think the the other difficulty is when when you try to do it a different a different way and say, okay, here's you can make a real investment in the stock market, uh, but you have ten dollars and that, you know, that's, uh, <laughs> and I don't know what fraction of a share of of Apple that is today, but it's a very small one and and it it, it leads to complexity. And so I was thinking about how do we how do I uh, talk to my children about the stock market uh, and let them take part in this without either uh, creating a worthless fantasy or uh, and counterproductive uh, imaginary game or um, annihilating any possible returns with, with you know, even a $5 commission on a purchase of a single share of stock would wipe out any reasonable gain that they could expect over a long period of time. And so what I did was I created a sort of a uh, like a shadow market where I, we used real stock prices uh, but it converted dollars into pennies. So that if a share of stock on the New York Stock Exchange was selling for $40, it, it sold for $0.40 cents on my stock exchange, and the kids could invest what they wanted to. There were no actual – I took the other side of every transaction. There were no actual orders going into the desk, at, the order desk at Charles Schwab. It was all just a paper stock market, but they were all based on, on, real, uh, on real prices. And it seemed like a, a simple way uh, to – um, let them get involved in buying stocks or uh, mutual funds or whatever they wanted to buy. I like the way you so describe how you started it, which was kind of cool. You had a you, you had a two hundred and fifty dollars seed fund from grandparents, right? That's right. And tell That's right. Tell, tell us what you did with it. You know, I have to see if I can remember. But I I thought that you know they really had to be pushed into to doing this, and so uh, you, I, you may need to tell the story because I'm. I'm it's been a while since uh, since I did, and I have to, uh, and I'll then I'll give a, you a caveat at the end of our discussion. Okay, so you went out, if I remember, and you took six stocks that you thought they'd have some awareness of. One was Intel because that was inside their computer. That's right. One was Microsoft, the Gap, where some of their clothes were from, McDonald's, where they'd eaten a hamburger. So they had some familiarity with the companies, and you endowed them with two hundred fifty dollars worth of those six companies. And but then they, that was that was interesting. You could have just given them a free lunch. I mean, a free start, but it was kind of a free lunch, but but you realize that you know there's so many stocks and so many bonds and it would be overwhelming. So you start with these six and then you said you can exchange among the six or you can expand if you want, sell them all back, start anew if you want. But you gave them something that they had some connection to. That's right. Good, good, good memory. <laughs> uh, yes. And, and the idea was that – I read it yesterday, Dave. Like, <laughs> <laughs> that the, the, the sort of the psychological barrier to, en to entry would be too high. How do you just start doing this? And, and it was easier for them to have something that they had to, uh, that they had to react to. And if they were, gonna, if they were not going to do it, they had to actively sell these things. Uh, now, as it turned out, and, and, and this is a real caveat, it, they never really – were interested in it, uh, and I think the reason was it's just it's sort of just more uh, it's too complex, and in a way, even though this brought it down to a scale where they could uh, to their to their scale, it was just it, for them at least it didn't it didn't really work, and we didn't and we didn't keep that going for very long. Uh, I ended up I made a I, I started when they got uh, to be old enough. Where they were no longer interested in having their savings monitored on my computer, and they both wanted their own debit cards and accounts at the bank, which was at, which happened when they turned 12. Uh, I what I did was I uh, started a, uh, a a money market fund that paid six percent a year, uh, in and uh, let them keep excess excess money in that. So they had a better they had a better return than they could get at the bank. So they still had an incentive. To save, but it was a little closer to what the the market rate was then, and that they were that they were okay with. The stock market never really never really appealed to them. I think it probably varies by kids. You know, I, I think, think it some does. Kids I know, I know would find kids it were... very interesting. Yes, and I, you know, and I think the um, going back to your earlier discussion, what's wrong with the current system? I, mean, I think you made some reference to doing it for a living or you know, investing as a grown up, but of course. 
a lot of these stock market competitions are sponsored by brokerage houses who profit from having people buy individual shares of stock. And so yeah. what, what these competitions do is encourage people to put all their eggs in one basket, the opposite of what you want. It encourages individual stock purchases. I don't think you can buy a mutual fund. And if you did, you wouldn't win. You're unlikely to win because somebody's going to take a shot at the one month. There's no downside. Uh, right. So you may as well take a shot at a high flyer and hope you can you can win. That's your best shot of winning. So I just uh, – anything – that gets them away from that. Uh, you know, your scheme was a little bit elaborate. And I, frankly, I, although I think some kids would be more interested than your kids were, it's still a lot of work for the parent to keep track of dividends and capital gains and, and all that. And uh, But anything that teaches them the value of – to me, there's only one thing that you want to teach your children about the stock market, which is don't put all your eggs in one basket. Mm -hmm. Actually, I'd say two things. Don't put all your eggs in one basket and don't listen to Uncle Ned, who, <laughs> right. who's, who's got a great stock that he's, he knows is going to go through the roof, that, that you can lose money. Uh, is th Those are the two really, I think, crucial lessons. Uh, and you really don't want to learn those as an adult with lots of money. You want to learn them when you're younger. Um, and so I, I think with – whether you do it through a, a mock stock exchange like you did, even if they weren't so interested, or if you lecture them relentlessly as I do about the <laughs> virtues of uh, diversification and indexed uh, mutual funds, which I think on average do pretty well, although this is not investment advice. Returns can vary, and uh, <laughs> right. be sure to consult That's your true. investment advisor uh, before making any decisions. Uh, this is not an investment show, but I do think that diversification is a really good idea. I think the only other the other key lesson, which uh, unfortunately our children are learning, is uh, humility, that things don't just keep going up. And I, I always think about my parents who grew up – my dad was born in 1930 and my mom was born in 1932. So they were children of the Depression. Their parents struggled, as did their relatives, most of them. Some people moved in with the one relative who was doing pretty well. And my dad got a lifelong aversion to equities, to stocks that I don't think is, was particularly healthy, but that's what he learned. Uh, mm -hmm. And it stuck with him because he heard his parents and uncles and aunts moaning their stock losses. And um, our kids right now are growing up in the time of, of this so-called Great Recession, and they're learning a lesson that markets don't always go up. Now, well, they'll remember that 40 years from now after a 15 year of – 15 years of, of you know golden returns, who knows? But I think if, that, if I had to teach my kids uh, one important lesson, it would be uh, the dangers of hubris and that, oh, I know what's going to happen and, and this portfolio has always done well, so it will continue to do well. Those kind of lessons, uh, being aware of the dangers of that, I think are the most important things. Yes, and I think the, 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 exactly. And the the place where my son, I think, learned the most valuable lesson about the stock market didn't involve the stock market at, at all. It involved Beanie Babies. Yeah, the, tell the that little, story. Uh, collectible, yeah, it's, a great, it's a great story. Uh, the uh, little collectible uh, toys that uh, became an extraordinary fad uh, when my son was in about fourth grade. And the boys and girls were collecting them. The girls collected them sort of as adorable things. The boys were all very market oriented in their beanie baby. Uh, they were collecting. evil. They were evil speculators. <laughs> they were, they were, and they had these uh, Beckett's guides to the market value, <laughs> supposed market values of beanie babies, and they would, they would sort of calculate their net worth from day to day, and uh, I would give them the, the standard lecture, saying, you know, these, the, the, these are not scarce. They're making more of them every second, and the. the they don't. There's no intrinsic value here. All this is all mania, and you're not. Uh, you know, they're they're not even worth what the six dollars or seven dollars that you paid for each one, and so forth and so forth. All in deaf ears because they had these books that they were looking at them. And then the a day came when my son was felt that he needed some money, and he told me he was he was going to sell uh, a couple of his more valuable Beanie Babies on eBay, uh, and. I said, I thought, ah, this is perfect. Uh, <laughs> he, he, he will learn now what I've been telling him. Uh, hypothetically, he'll see for himself that how foolish this is. And so he, he put a pair of uh, Beanie Baby Bears uh, on for sale on eBay. And these were ones that he had, you know, been throwing around the house and in the yard even. <laughs> he described their condition as mint, and then uh, put, <laughs> put them for sale on eBay. Fraud. <laughs> Fraud. Exactly. <laughs> Seven days later, they sold for $123.50. And 
I to your horror, them, yeah, <laughs> to my horror. Yeah, but I was still thinking there's a lesson here that we're going to learn very soon, and I helped him box them up and uh, warning him uh, not to be disappointed if the buyer uh, angrily demanded her money back, which was what I was pretty sure was going to happen because they're conditioned. Uh, because they're, you know, and just buyers remorse, their condition, I would have by then thought that. Uh, but a few days later, the buyer sent my son an effusive email saying that she was thrilled with her purchase. And uh, so I said to him, I said, nah, I said that, you know, I wasn't going to give you any more financial advice. I'm going to give you one more. And then it's <laughs> sell your entire collection immediately. Uh, and he didn't because he, they were, you know, they were too valuable and markets can go only up. And he's, he's 24 now. He still regrets uh, this thing that happened when he was eight, that he had been, that he hadn't sold his Yeah, he's still waiting. Collection. He's still waiting. he still has, right. He's still waiting. <laughs> he's still waiting for them to be even worth, you know, yeah. five cents. Uh, but I think that's, you know, let's say he learned the same, uh, he, he learned the same lesson that grownups did in, uh, in the late uh, 1990s, which is that, uh, the stock market doesn't always go up, and but he learned it at a very low cost. He saw both ends of a bubble at um, at basically no effect on his on his life, except to to make this permanent lesson that uh, that, that this doesn't happen. And and and, and in there, my favorite one of my favorite headlines in the Onion uh, a number of years later or year, years later was um, something like you know. Uh, Americans demand new bubble to invest in, and, uh, <laughs> and I, I, the uh, so yeah. that was, I think that's but but that was an enduring lesson that came from from uh, this uh, it sort of evolved all by itself and came from what I initially thought was a foolish activity and is is a good example I think of why you you know your kids should have some some slack to do things that you know are stupid. Uh, not only because it might turn out in the end not to be as stupid as you think it is, but and then fortunately turn out after that to be every bit as stupid as you thought it was. But it gives them the responsibility, uh, the, the possibility of seeing this for themselves. Well, the first... eBay was actually was a, was a useful, I think, and it still is a useful, uh, useful teaching tool for kids because one of the things about kids in their possessions is if they can learn is that their their possessions have. Uh, have value, you know. They have capital. They have, you know. I have this bicycle. I have this. I have these toys. Have value. They didn't really have them before. On eBay, though, you can sell something that you, you know. Here's this uh, this game I had that um, was given to me. But if I take good care of it, I may be able to get some money back for it by selling it on eBay. And uh, I think that was a valuable lesson to it. It changed my kids' uh, ideas about their uh, their possessions. Be- suddenly, they're their things began to look like assets to them rather than just, you know, sort of the, the litter in their room. And they, yeah. they were more careful with uh, with their stuff. Yeah, that's very cool. You, know, you, you mentioned how they would take the packaging and treat it instead of just trashing it immediately. They'd save it in case they wanted to sell it later, which uh, yeah, not a bad not a bad lesson in life, although it does require a larger house as, right. you, as you get older. Uh, the first part of that story, uh, the when this, to your horror, your, your son received a check for over $100 Reminds me of a gl- really wonderful Somerset Mom short story called The Facts of Life. If, if you haven't read it out there, uh, go Google it or find it. Uh, the second part reminds me, along with the first part, about the role of supply and demand. It seems that supply and demand are a very useful thing uh, for children to understand, in particular about the supply and demand of, of labor and how wages get determined. As I was reading your book, I was thinking of a story I read recently – where a woman tired of being a waitress uh, decides she's sick of people demanding stuff of her. She's not making a lot of money. She wanted to be a writer. It wasn't happening. And she decides she didn't want to be in the service business anymore. So she she's taken yoga all her adult or semi-adult life. And so she decides – well, she looks at the yoga instructor and thinks, well, this is a good job. You get to come to work in your pajamas. <laughs> uh, it's not that hard and it's kind of spiritual and you probably make good money. And so she went and took a training class in being a yoga instructor only to find that after finishing the class, she couldn't find much work. And when she did, didn't pay very well uh, and that she was still in the service business and she was still catering to people. And those lessons um, really are important lessons to learn about how the world works. Uh, if something's relatively easy to do and pleasant, it's not going to pay very much. Um, 
it's just the way of the world. If you want to make a lot of money, which is by itself, maybe not the best goal, but if you want a certain level of comfort, you got to have a skill and it has to be acquired with some effort. Otherwise, lots of other people will acquire it and it won't pay very well. Um, and if you're like a lot of other people, you have to stand out. You have to cater better than the other ones. Do something extra. Find a way to deliver the yoga class that people want it rather than just like everybody else. Otherwise, you'll just earn what everybody else earns. So those kind of lessons seems to me, um, those are pretty useful. Yes, very useful. I, if, I could have, if I could have become a, an introduction to economist, I would have because when I took uh, introductory economics in college when I was a freshman, I, it was just I just felt as though it explained everything, and it's really introductory economics is really psychology. It's a course in psychology. And it's, it's how it, people it behave. It explains human yeah. behavior. Uh, unfortunately, economics goes beyond uh, introduction to economics. In, in that, <laughs> as, soon, <laughs> as soon as it got to the statistics part, I realized that I, I wasn't cut out for it. But I wanted to go back. In fact, I wouldn't mind majoring in in the introductory level of almost anything. Uh, those were always my favorite courses in college, but uh, but I think that the that a good beginning economics textbook explains uh, much of what you need to know about about human nature and uh, was I found it in, in you know geopolitics and everything and it seemed uh, I thought I I still think that was the most valuable course I took and the one that made the the most dramatic uh, change in the way I thought about things uh, you know and, and I ended up as an English major. Well, the late great Paul Hain, wonderful teacher and writer and economist. Uh, he made a distinction between uh, the poetry and prose of economics. The principles is the poetry. That's what makes you fall in love with economics. It's the art of it and the magic of it and the way of looking at the world that you haven't thought about before and it hooks you. And then you get into the prose. Some of the, you know, you get into the math, you get into the, the graphs. And um, I think most of the values in the poetry myself. Um, and I, what I find interesting is how many introductory classes I took in college that didn't have any poetry. They were just dumbed down versions of the most mm. prosaic graduate level stuff, uh, then spoon fed to us as undergraduates. But the stuff that changed your life, the stuff that gave you a new way of looking at the world, those classes, yeah, I'd take that introductory philosophy class, poetry class, economics class. Um, those were phenomenal when they're well taught, but they can be really badly taught too. <laughs> uh, also true. Yeah. Um, uh, let's move to the last part of the book, which is um, a discussion of what gives life its meaning um, and what's of true value and where does true wealth come from. Um, what, is, what role does money play in those things? You, you have some interesting ideas and in what you think children should, should start to think about. Well, I think uh, the, main, the main thing is, is that money is not unimportant, as, as people will sometimes say when they talk about enjoyment of life or about you know what what's meaningful in life money is extraordinarily useful it's the, the you know a tool that that you can use to you know to finance your wonderful life i think when it money gets leads people into problems is you know when there isn't enough of it when you spend uh time you know in a panic about buying medicine for your children and things like that when there's when there's too little to to let to allow you to think about anything else and then also when when it becomes an end in itself, and when it becomes all, all consuming, uh, you know, greed is uh, is not good. Greed is a, is is an addiction. It's like a drug. It's uh, because you can never uh, you can never satisfy it. So I think that the the healthy attitude about money is that is that it's a tool that it's a necessary tool that you use to, to make yourself happy or whatever whatever it is the goal is. And I began thinking about the the a different um an idea different from net worth uh, which is the way we usually think about about ourselves or often think about ourselves and and uh, something that I, I think I call true net value or 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 something like that or your true net worth which has to do with your satisfaction in life and the thought that had occurred to me was that you know you we're never going to have as much money as bill gates does but on an hour for hour basis it's entirely possible to take as much satisfaction from life as Bill Gates does, if you think of your life in that way. Maybe and, a lot more. Maybe a lot more, certainly when he's, you know, being uh, grilled by, uh, you know, by government officials or by angry shareholders or by, uh, or, or just involved in all the the challenges that, that he, he gets stuck in. If we can be sort of clear-eyed about what it is in our lives that, uh, Makes us satisfied. That satisfies us. That makes us happy. And and 
and and and figure out what it takes to to do those things and to focus on them. That it's it's a much it becomes a much simpler problem. And you know you see it when um you know when the, this irrational behavior that takes place whenever the, the a huge lottery uh, uh, you know national lottery gets to you know whatever I don't know what the threshold is that makes people suddenly think that they should be driving across state lines to buy yeah. lottery tickets. It's like five hundred three hundred million or five hundred million dollars. But it's I think that's the you know that's the crazy way to think about money and 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 even though I'm sure we'd all be happy if we had our own jet, there are, are different ways to to think about it and to and to to make things to make our lives better for ourselves. And you talk about the things that, you know the the attributes and and interests and uh, skills that we have, of course, are our true and our our connections to other people goes without saying. Those are our true measures of of wealth and happiness. Um, and where we get our deepest satisfactions that endure, that are not short-lived, that don't just vanish when the when the uh, tomahawk breaks or the right. uh, your, your uh, latest device doesn't sink or whatever it is. Yeah, and one way to think about that is to think about you know what you would you, you know imagine uh, a, a fire or some other disaster destroying uh, the, the the kind of physical manis- manifestations of your life. What would you what would you save if you could save a box a box full? And not just the not just objects, but you know whatever they. What would you put in your box? You know, from from your life, what is it that makes you happy? And then you know, my own uh, not very imaginative life. The thing that probably makes me the happiest, you know, aside from uh, family, you know, the the obligatory, you know, children, wife, dog, etc. Is you know, is playing golf. And and uh, the I when I think about staying healthy, it's because I I think it's 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 because I want to keep playing golf for as long as I can. And when I think about uh, earning money it's often because i think you know if i if i can do this i can then i can take this golf trip with my friends and and if you think of uh things that way I, you know it's a very simple it's a very simple thing but it's a, it's a different it's a, it's a, it's a useful way to think about to think about your life and to and to focus what's on actually important what's actually important and it, and, and i think for me it was this idea of you think about you know how do i maximize the my satisfaction, not on a on an hourly basis, rather than on an, on an income basis. And uh, well, it's the, I always say it's the scarcest thing we own is our time. And, right. Yeah. Uh, no matter what. It, it, yeah. We often use it so badly. Uh, no one on his deathbed wishes he'd spent more time at the office. Right. And it's just very, um, it's very hard um, to to do that balance. I I'm going to inter- interrupt for a sec. I'm going to read a very short poem. Which uh, you you don't allude to the poem, but you allude to the sentiment. It's by Franklin P. Adams. It's called "The Rich Man." Uh, Franklin P. Adams wrote, I think, two poems that are noteworthy. One was one that immortalized Tinker's to Evers to Chance, the double play combination. But uh, the other was this poem, "The Rich Man." It's uh, short. The rich man has his motor car, his country, and his town estate. He smokes a fifty cent cigar and jeers at fate. He frivols through the live long day. He knows not poverty, her pinch. His lot seems light. His heart seems gay. He has a cinch. Yet though my lamp burns low and dim, though I must slave for livelihood, think you that I would change with him? You bet I would. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, we have that urge um, to swap. Uh, we wish, we think if we were like Bill Gates, we'd be happy all the time. Uh, and most of us do try to acquire more money rather than less, but we do also find out that it's not the source of happiness. But without it, it's tough, uh, and I think that balance is really what you talk about in the book, and that we're talking about right now. Right. Yeah. It's it's uh, somehow making yourself uh, under have an understanding of, or sort of a clear-eyed understanding of of sufficiency, and uh, I think that sufficiency is often the the key to maximizing uh, happiness. You don't want. I don't think you know. You don't want to be to think. Well, I'm gonna. Uh, Sort of, I'll ruin my life and my family's life up to the time I'm 65, and then I'll be, you know, <laughs> then I'll be a good husband. Then I'm going to live the way I want good to. Good dad. Well, yeah. You know, we, people get struck down all the time at, at the age of 64, and so you don't necessarily want to put all your all your chips on a on, on a square that you may not get to. It's better to to think about these things as as we sort of go along, and uh, it's it's a you know it's an impossible balance. No matter how much you think about it, it's 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 hard to do the right thing, and then life has a way of of uh, throwing things at you that that um, that you didn't count on, and that, that yeah. uh, throw off all your calculations. But certainly, how we 
treat our own careers and how we talk about them and and how we treat money in our families affects how our kids our kids are watching all the time um and um you know that's uh how we talk and what we do are the two things that the, that they that educate them um very true and i think this is this is true too we talk about teaching our kids about money we're teaching our kids about money constantly uh you know and, and not necessarily the lessons that we that we want them yeah. to learn you know uh when you sweat over uh, credit card balances, when you're afraid to answer the phone because you think it might be a collection agency, when you come home from work and are angry or pour yourself a big drink or complain about what happened there, all these things we're teaching kids about money. And so, you know, uh, it's worth it, valuable to ourselves too, to step outside and take a look at these things and see how we're doing them. There was an interesting uh, study recently, I'll probably get it wrong, but it had to do with people made uh, more intelligent decisions about their retirement savings when they were looking at a picture of themselves that had been artificially aged to make them <laughs> look like they were retirement age. And it, it became tangible to them. And it's probably not a bad bad way to think about all kinds of things in your life. If you can really force yourself to uh, to suspend your disbelief in mortality and, and you know, realize that we, the time eventually runs out and, and, and think, how is this how I want to uh, to allocate my time during this, this, you know, this extraordinary gift of just being of being alive. Yeah, couldn't agree with you more. Uh, the book ends with a a rather um, it seems to be a little bit of a a change of pace, a little bit off the topic, but I I saw it uh, as you did as as very much in in the same theme, and I, I would describe it as the best investment you can make in your kids and for your kids. I think. Modern parents um, are obsessed with their kids getting into college and to the best college. As someone who works in the kitchen, I'm I'm not as um, enamored of brand names as <laughs> I think mo- some of my friends are. But um, we spend, I think, modern parents who are financially comfortable spend a lot of time, and those who aren't even spend a lot of time thinking about these things. How am I going to get my kids to have as as good a life as I have, ideally better. We, you know, we love our children. We want them to do well. And we've been talking about what we might do to help them understand money, which is a very, very useful thing to do. But at the end of the book, you talk about a very different investment, which is um, reading to your kids. Uh, this is one part of the book which I agreed with 100 and so percent um, in terms of both practice and ideals. So talk about uh, why you think that's important and how to do it. Well, I think it's important because uh, I think the easiest way to to give kids a solid uh, educational intellectual foundation for everything they do in school is to help them become good readers. And the easiest way to uh, help them become good readers is to read to them uh, beginning from when they're very young and for as long as they can stand it. And it gets them uh, – you addict them to books. You get them addicted to books, and, it, and, I, and I think it lasts for their whole life. I like this, especially the part as long as they can stand it, because I think most people feel that you read them a few picture books when they're three or four and you've done your time. And But I, some of the most satisfying reading I've done to my kids is when they were 10 and 12 and, and older. It's I love reading to my kids if they'll take it. They don't always want to hear it, but it's no, but wonderful. If you, if, you start, if you start young, I think it, they'll, they, they tolerate it for longer than they might if you, you know, suddenly started when they were 12 or 13. But you can, sure. if, they, if you've started when they were very little, uh, before they had any – comprehension of what you were saying to them you know they see it and 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 actually nowadays you know i think we're much better at understanding the value of it just because of the the how much uh, audiobooks have become a part of our lives anybody who commutes in a car you know we enjoy being read to yeah uh and it's it's valuable i think uh, for the you know for those practical reasons that it 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 turns kids and helps them become good readers on their own but I think it also it's a it's just an easy um, satisfying kind of family glue uh reading to kids it's it it it's also it's a kind of it's it's therapeutic it, you know you can see, i've saw this with with friends of my children when they were young who were unmanageable uh, until you start reading to them and then just you know they calm down they put their thumb in their mouth they kids like being read to. And if you do it, it's it's a, it, you create this sort of uh, bo- very strong bond that um, that they respond to, that you respond to. It's this it's one of the things that I loved about having kids was that here was this 
uh, I discovered was here was this opportunity to reread these books mm-hmm. that I, you know, that I loved as a child, and then to discover new ones that I hadn't, and and also you discover that that children's literature, especially as they get a little bit older, uh, beats almost anything that that uh, mm-hmm. that on the adult shelf, and so uh, they it there there are huge benefits to the to to the parents too, and what my wife and I found was you know that it becomes a a family activity. We always you know going off to hitting all the libraries in our in our region so that we could we could once we'd exhausted the you know the nearest libraries that could go somewhere it was always something you could do and then when we traveled, our kids were always well behaved on the plane because we uh, there, were, there were big be- canvas bean bags full of books. Uh, people are always asking us, "Are you teachers?" It's, you know, there could be no other explanation for uh, for for doing this. And, and you see, I just came back from from Scotland and from and from Ireland, and I'm always amazed to see parents will get on a plane with a with a four year old with nothing, uh, expecting the child to to sort of entertain himself in his mind, I guess, uh, for you know, a six or seven seven hour flight. It's it's not possible. Uh, they're not going to be happy looking at that Sky Mall catalog. Uh, in even you know the, the it's just not it's reading is better. Yeah, the and, the, the other thing I think that's um, that you didn't mention that I'd encourage people out there listening is is to read your kids hard books, not just easy ones. When they're little, you read them easy ones and they learn them by heart. And I think one of the most glorious and sometimes frustrating parts of being a parent is the seven hunters reading of the dot in the line or right. Harold's purple crayon or Harold and the purple crayon or, you know, my, my kids love curious George. My wife didn't. And I always ended up being the curious George reader. Um, and uh, it's funny. I mentioned the dot in the line. It's not really a children's book and I didn't read it to my kids, but I thought of it when I was trying to think of Harold and the purple crayon. Harold the purple, right. But the other thing, when they get older, I would read them harder books that they couldn't always understand, and sometimes I'd explain, and sometimes I wouldn't. I mean, we read uh, – I think I've probably mentioned it before. We'd read uh, P.G. Woodhouse, Joy in the Morning, which is an unbelievably entertaining book, which I recommend. I'd read them to my – I read it to my, I think, uh, 9 and 11 or 10 and 12-year-old sons when they were um, – before they went to bed every night until we finished it, which shocked me that we got through it, but it, it held their attention. And I – you know, we'd talk about it. The characters became vivid. And I also read my kids sometimes um, uh, Homer's um, Odyssey, the Odyssey in, mm. in, the, in the Fagel's translation, which is very hard. But if you pick the juicy parts, like the Cyclops, where they poke his eye out with a burning uh, ember, a burning mm-hmm. uh, log, or the scene where Ulysses returns home confronted by Penelope's suitors and unmasks himself and reveals he's Ulysses, and they're scared out of their minds, and he takes this bow that they haven't, that no one in the room could bend, and he bends its strings and starts firing away. I mean, it's straight out of uh, a modern uh, movie. And uh, my kids just ate it up. They didn't understand every word. I'm sure I don't understand every word, but the cadence is good. And and I, while I'm on this soapbox, poetry is just a really great thing to read to kids, mm-hmm. especially uh, poets like Kipling and Robert Service who have great rhythms and rhymes. And kids will remember those poems all their lives. Yeah, I, I, I... Extremely, very true. I I'm a million percent agree with re- reading hard books, even when kids are very young. I remember when I was, I don't know, he was like two or three, and, or uh, maybe not quite that young, but two or three or four, say. And I I read him uh, Treasure Island, Robert Louis Stevenson, yeah. and it's it's very hard, uh, seemingly confusing, but I could see he was playing in the playroom. That's the other thing I think. Kids often need to be uh, doing something while you're reading to them, and if you say. You know, get back on, get back over here on the couch. It's they, they they can't necessarily always do that. And so, some of my favorite times reading the kids were when they were doing something else. And you know, my son would be building something with Lego. Uh, and I remember reading, uh, say, and I remember reading Treasure Island to him, and when he was seemingly completely too young to understand it, and I would see him pause. You know, Lego pieces held uh-huh. in the air yeah. as he was listening to some tense moment. And so he was, you know, he was listening. The whole time, my daughter used to, uh, when I would be reading, uh, she she began reading very early, and uh, was reading a book to my son, and she was lying on the bed reading a different book to herself, but was still paying attention to what I was reading to him, and would comment occasionally on uh, uh, on <laughs> Stevenson's on, prose <laughs> style. On that. So <laughs> I think that's a that's a another value of reading to kids. They become good listeners, uh, and I think they that that the reason that your kids could understand. Uh, books that were way over reading level uh, for them is that they, you know, 
they learn to by by listening listening all along and it's a i think it's a huge skill and i think that it, it uh that it, it makes them better writers better readers we learn to write by not by following rules but by just absorbing yeah. the language from from reading and writing is a is a huge skill i'm sure i'm sure you see it in in economics it's huge and not necessarily a common skill and it it underlies almost everything i use i one of my early books had to do with um uh, the, it was a sort of an expose of the educational testing service, the, the company that makes the SAT and, and other standardized tests. And one of the, uh, I think, was sort of little known facts about it is that the, the math SAT is very much a verbal test too, because you, know how to it, read it, you have to be able to to sort of it's it's a language test, a vocabulary test, in addition, because you, you, and that's true, I think, in every. Every subject, you you don't uh, you don't get a pass on reading just because you're going to go into the sciences because all those same literary skills are just as important there. Yeah, reading is everything. Um, it's I don't really think of it anymore as reading because the world's changed so much. It's really uh, it's the wor- growth as a human being is is about absorbing new information and learning. And reading is the most common way it's been done in the past. But people used to tell stories and. Mm-hmm. Now we tell stories. We used to, for a while. We told them through the printed page, and then it, then it's became the the audio book. And now it's the internet, and your um, iPad talks to you. And there's just everything is exploding. But it's all about slowing your life down so that you can absorb information. And if you can't do that, your life's going to be hard. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's really important. Yes, our, it's our our most important software is this. You know, the language ability. It's what distinguishes us from. From who knows what, but I think it's very true. And however you, there are lots of different ways to cultivate that. But I think if you, as we, if we think of, you know, what, how do I invest in my children? How do I? It, it should be things like that. It's not the, the, it's more important to do something like that than to think about building, building, uh, you know, building your estate so that they can uh, inherit it and go off and squander it someplace. It's more you want to, you want to um, teach them how to learn. Right. Teach them, how to learn, teach them how to learn, and teach them how to really how to enjoy, and how to how to be uh, to find to be content within themselves in a way to entertain themselves in a way that uh, you know it's a, it's a powerful, powerful tool, uh, which has also has benefits for you if you have young children. When I remember there was this 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 great breakthrough, it felt I, it just felt like the most extraordinary thing when we, my wife and I were driving on a uh, a trip with our kids, and our daughter in the back seat was reading to her brother. Uh, and <laughs> it's like we had invented a perpetual motion machine yeah. almost, you know, now it was, it was just, you know, this, after an investment of a few years in reading to our kids, now they could read to each other. And, and there we were in the front seat, you know, sort of quietly having a conversation between ourselves. My guest today has been David O. And David, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Oh, thank you. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.